when this global crisis started and it, it was just such a uncertain time, such a time of, you know, fear, um, social isolation, which we try so hard to fight became almost mandated when, you know, since we have to all stay in our homes. Um, so she reached out to us and said, we got to do something. I know a ton of experts of inspiring amazing people. I'm going to use my connections. I'm going to get them online to talk. Can you guys help, you know, um, on the tech side? Can you help uh, put together the audience and it has just been um, an amazing collaboration um, and we've been I, I, I think what are we on week three or four now um, so really excited with the variety of topics that we've covered we're always looking for um, ideas for more topics more things that um, you want to hear about so keep those coming um, and I will now um, turn it over to you, Dr. Subramanian. Thank you. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's pretty rainy over here. It's been rainy in, in Los Angeles and I think in other parts of the country for a few days, which makes the staying in shelter in place orders even more kind of stressful and a bit more depressing. But um, hopefully everyone's staying safe and doing well. Uh, thank you again, PMD Alliance, for letting me have my uh, peeps on this and uh, you know bring you some information hopefully that's helpful and we welcome feedback and welcome more um, you know varied topics in the future as well so um, I wanted to introduce um, my colleague Mina Makajani who is a friend and a colleague she wears many hats she's a traditional um, Indian dancer um, and uh, she is um, uh, also uh, she plays music. She's a musician, collaborates with a lot of people. So she really talks the talk about, you know, being um, explorative in terms of your mental state and your hobbies. And she walks that walk too. She's very interested in integrative medicine. She did a training uh, after her internal, internal medicine residency with um, geriatrics and ended up um, having a uh, um, the pleasure for me of having her rotate through our Parkinson's clinics, I think at the UCLA side at that point, um, and our their fellows continue to rotate with us at, at the VA side now. And it's been a great collaboration for us to learn from geriatrics doctors who specialize in um, the world of aging and um, keeping people healthy into their, you know, 80s and beyond. Um, and she also, um, so has that background and then she's been the doctor, in-house doctor at the um, Motion Picture Home, which she will describe to you, which is kind of a unique setting here in Los Angeles and kind of brings um, together a number of um, the issues that we have been talking about around long-term care settings and facilities um, that are uh, locked down in some regards for visitors and safety issues in those sorts of places. And so I wanted her to come on and teach us a little bit about where she works and what kind of things they've been doing to try to prevent um, this virus from affecting their uh, occupants or, or patients that live there. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Mina. Mm -hmm. Hi. And, uh, hello, everybody. Um, sorry, I got a little delayed. Things have been absolutely crazy over here with uh, many sick patients, unfortunately. So I do apologize, but um, I really Thank you for joining us. Regardless. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, it's really a pleasure to get to connect with all of you um, and with Dr. Subramanian through this way. I don't know if she mentioned, because I came a little late, but that uh, I had the great opportunity to train under her in my geriatrics training. I got to rotate through her clinic and I learned so much from her. That was um, nine years ago already. Oh my gosh. Wow. I know. And, um, you know, so I really learned so much that I get to apply to my patients now, but also because we're both colleagues in the same health system, I get to refer my patients to her and she you know, continues to provide excellent care. And it's just wonderful to know her as an exceptional physician, teacher, and person. So it's a really mm -hmm. great project that you have here, Dr. Subramanian. So thank, thank you, you thank for having me. Sure, so. So I um, just mentioned, you know, just before you came on that you work in the motion picture hub, but you also have this geriatric background and um, you were going to speak a little bit about the place where maybe you could tell us a little bit about the place in which you practice right now. Sure. So it's a very unique setting. It's 
it's a campus that is home to about um, 300 individuals um, ages. Uh, for the most part, they're 65 and older. We do have a few that are younger that would have certain geriatric syndromes like dementia, Parkinson's even. Um, so we do have a few younger people, but it's uh, essentially from age um, 65 and our oldest resident is 109 years old. Wow. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we have a really tremendous range, not just of ages, but of abilities. So on this campus, we have independent living. So people are living in their own little cottages. They prepare meals, they drive, they go places. Um, they're completely independent. Then we have some who are more assisted. So we have other buildings that, are, that offer more assistance. So those are assisted living facilities um, to help with medications, you know, changing, even transferring, bathing, you know, um, so many different uh, aspects as people's needs increase. And then we also have the nursing home side, so long-term care. Um, and then we even have a locked dementia unit, which is also considered under long-term care. So we really have the full spectrum, which is really wonderful because people can come when they're you know, very independent and on the younger side, and as their needs develop, as they age, they can so-called age in place on this campus. So it's, um, it's really amazing to get to see that and that we can really get to know our patients that way kind of through their life that they're here. So I have a clinic on this site. So, you know, patients who live on this campus, as well as people who live in their own homes can come into my clinic over here and I see them. We can even make home visits to their uh, residences here, like the assisted living side if needed. Um, and then I, we also see the patients who are in the um, long-term care nursing home. We even have, I forgot to mention, an uh, uh, inpatient uh, geriatric psychiatry unit too. So we have that uh, level of hospital care here. Yeah. That's really a lot of patients to take care yes. of. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what the virus, uh, what kind of issues have come up around this virus time frame and how you've been sort of approaching those in the place sure. that you're... Sure. So um, I'll start where we are today and go backwards kind of. So um, where we are today, unfortunately, we have several patients who have uh, tested positive for covid We've even had a few deaths. Um, it's been you know, such a difficult time for all of us because we really do feel like a family here. Like I said, we really get to know our residents um, so well. Most of them have lived here for many years. So that's been a really uh, difficult time for this family here. Um, and you know, we have several more who are extremely sick um, because they are, again, nursing home residents. They have multiple comorbidities that you hear about in the news. So they are really at the highest risk for this disease. So we are you know, working as hard as we can to keep the rest of the, um, the residents who have not contracted it, to keep them from contracting the disease. Um, so we're you know, constantly working on different strategies for that, cleaning continuously, of course, um, you know, screening staff, th those who do have it, doing everything we can to keep them well. Um, in every way we can, and we're just learning about this disease every day. But what steps we had taken before? So, you know, going back to the beginning of March, so already for more than a month, we had locked down the campus, which meant um, typically people are free to leave. They go to other doctor's appointments uh, for their, you know, specialists, et cetera. They go to visit friends and family. They go across the street. We have a Starbucks and a shopping center. They, many of them would go there. Family members would come here to visit those who are a little um, uh, less mobile. We stopped all of that about a month ago, even though there were no cases even in Los Angeles at that point. But because, you know, we learned the unfortunate tragedy from the Evergreen Nursing Home in Washington, Kirkland, Washington. So we'd really learned from that and taken every step um, to try to prevent it from coming here for this very vulnerable population. We also started at that time screening. So every individual, you know, myself, all of the staff, and any authorized visitors, like um, maybe, you know, visiting nurses, that sort of thing, everybody was screened. So temperature screening, as well as questionnaires. Have you been around anybody who's tested positive for COVID? Have you traveled out of the country in the past 14 days, etc.? So we had really rigorous screening and again our residents were not allowed to leave. Family members were not allowed to come in which is such a difficult thing especially for those residents who are again less mobile. 
and less able to interact. It was such a difficult uh, decision, but we knew that this is what we had to do to safeguard everybody. Um, the, the other thing uh, I would mention is because this is a large facility with hundreds of older adults, you know, every year we do our, our own version of a lockdown or quarantine every single year with flu. Sometimes we have norovirus outbreaks. So our residents, unfortunately, are used to this. It's nothing new, but this is, of course, a whole different level, a whole different level of fear um, that everybody had. And so, you know, we took, I want to say we took every precaution possible, but unfortunately, it still came in. And I think that goes back to this same issue about visitors, that in the end, it just tells us that the visitors, whether they're, uh, and when I say visitors in this case, it means doctors, nurses, uh, cleaning people, you know, all the healthcare providers are unfortunately the vectors that brought this in. Yeah, it's very, um, it's, it must be very stressful because I think that we do our best as doctors to get a sense of who may be carrying this and we get a sense of, you know, you know maybe from symptoms, but mm -hmm. one of the main issues in this situation is that the asymptomatic carrier rate. So that means people who don't have symptoms who are carrying the virus, who may be in a younger population, a healthier population, um, who are still essential workers, basically, um, right. like you and I, who still have to care for our patients and um, nurses and all the basic, basic things. Um, we all may be carrying this virus. And that's why um, I've told my patients to be extra, extra careful and take those seven layers of, um, you know, sort of extra care and it might seem kind of crazy. And Mina, you, know, you and I both have aging parents as well. Right. Um, right. And I know that we've been sharing some, you know, strategies and stories just of how to keep them safe too. So it's not just um, as doctors that we're providing this sort of information, but also as loved, you know, children of parents and um, caring individuals of neighbors and um, family, friends, and all the, all the rest. So um, it's, it's just a really tough time that we're all in. And, and it's um, often putting people probably at their most stressed out, vulnerable time periods um, from a psychological perspective, where the normal um, uh, response would be to hug a loved one or to see your parents and want to, you know, hold them near and, you know, be, be physically um, close to them and, and be able to provide that physical kind of intimacy, even with our patients. I, I'm a hugger. I think you are too. For <laughs> yes. um, you know, we've really, and even on my team, you know, we're going through a lot of tough times these days with um, every day, you know, we're hearing news from here and there. And, you know, I think as a team, we often hug it out or, you know, hold hands or, you know, um, and we just haven't been able to do that. This distancing has really put an extra strain on each and every one of our um, ways to cope and our relationships with others as well. Um, so, um, so you mentioned the comorbidities. Um, just hold on one second. Uh, Drea, the thing is, all we have a new Roomba. Sorry, Treya. And sorry. My, my children, <laughs> as one of the fabulous new uh, things that we've got around here, my <laughs> son has bought this automatic vacuum cleaner that, that seems to turn on at the wrong times when I'm on meetings like this. So <laughs> you might have to uh, put it in. It's like this. Anyway, um, so welcome to my household. I, I sequestered my children, but not all the automatic things that are in the background here. Um, but you mentioned these... Um, what we call comorbidities as doctors. Could you explain that a little bit more? Because I think that that's really important um, sure. <laughs> to, to sort of, um, you know, tease out here uh, sure. and, and, and explain, because I think people have a sense that it's only really super old, super frail, people above 85, you know, that are having these things happen to them. And maybe you could just tell me from your geriatrics lens, or even as a doctor, just observing the news and the information, right. what, what populations are you seeing getting sick and, and who should be worried about this? So, you know, the reports have said definitely anybody over 65, for sure. Um, even if you're fairly healthy, I mean, just are immune, and there could be so many different reasons why this group is more at risk, but it could even just be that our immunity decreases with time. You know, that's one idea that people have thought. So even the very healthy who are over 65 do need to be extremely cautious. 
over 80, there's a you know much higher risk even than the group that's 65 to 80. So there, you know, everybody just needs to take uh, extreme precautions. I would say you can't be too careful about that. But in terms of actual comorbidities, that would be things like high blood pressure, or hypertension, um, any kind of cardiac disease. We're seeing now as the disease has kind of been present for a little longer, we're seeing that it's leading to a lot of significant heart disease. And so people who have any underlying heart conditions, whether that's atherosclerosis, um, if they've had a heart attack, if they've had stents, anything like that, that does put them at a higher risk. Diabetes is definitely a really big one. Um, people with diabetes often have uh, multi-organ involvement, as you say, so many of the organs are affected when you have um, diabetes, but especially the vascular system. And so, you know, that's again, an, another area where we're seeing really significant problems in, in diabetics. Um, anybody with underlying lung conditions, so COPD, asthma, people with a smoking history, again, a very tremendous risk. So those are some of the major, what we call comorbidities um, that, you know, we'd be extra cautious about. And uh, I'm definitely seeing that in my patients. Anybody with any of those um, are faring, unfortunately, not quite as well. And um, it looks like more men, I guess, than, than women yes, are affected. Yes. And we're not sure exactly why that is, from what I can understand, quite yet. Exactly. Yeah, we, we don't know. But if you just look at, um, you know, typical lifespan data, even prior to COVID, um, men do, their lifespan is shorter than women. Um, that, is, uh, that is pretty standard, definitely in the U.S. That's the case anyway. So, it, you know, it could be that... Um, just these same type of comorbidities that they kind of advance faster in men, you know, that could be part of the problem. I'm not sure exactly that, you know, why, um, why men are facing this more. And then I've also noticed just looking at the statistics and um, I'm actually hoping to maybe even put out a public service announcement because I'm pretty close to a number of musicians in, in certain types of these risk groups. Um, I have noticed that it looks like African Americans are passing mm -hmm. at a much higher rate than right. their, you know, um, Caucasian, I guess, right. uh, cohort in the same places. And even it looks like Latinos maybe as well in New York City and some of these mm -hmm. places. Um, and I don't, I can't really get a, get a sense of if it is um, because of those extra comor comorbidities. So the extra things that people take pills every day for. So things like asthma, um, the sugar problems and uh, high blood pressure, and even um, the weight issues sometimes that come along with some of these populations being at more risk for some of this stuff may put them at increased risk. But even with that um, said, I still am a little um, uh, worried about the, the increased numbers that we're seeing in these um, populations of, of people actually dying um, in, in certain right. parts of the country that are quite, um, quite extraordinary. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you're in any of these sorts of populations, any of these sorts of um, groups, uh, and, or you know somebody who's a loved one that is still not really taking this very seriously, because I think some parts of the country are still, and I know we may have even have people from Florida on our um, call today, and other places that we've been trying to spread um, this uh, uh, virtual support group to, I think some of those folks are not being, you know, asked to shelter in place yet. Hopefully, it'll come soon. But um, I think we just want to take an extra precaution if you're in any of those populations. And, and I think there's even been a sense of, if you take a pill or two every day, you're probably at increased risk than somebody who isn't on medication for various other reasons. And I think even the Parkinson's population, as we mentioned, because of sometimes um, worsening of Parkinson's around when you get sick or even possible swallow issues and other lung issues that sometimes happen as the disease advances, um, we, we need to be extra careful in our populations as well. Absolutely. I mean, that's, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a huge issue that is being tracked very closely. Why is the, there a disproportionate rate of deaths uh, among like black and Latino populations right now throughout the country. And, you know, part of some of the analysis is that it's due to um, historic uh, differences in access to healthcare. So already they're at a disadvantage in many cases, especially in certain states, like they're seeing that in the deep south, um, really big increases in deaths over there. In New York City, though, 
um, it's still a higher proportion even compared to the uh, percentage of population in the city. I was just looking at those numbers yesterday. So it's, you know, it's definitely a huge concern. Um, there are other ideas that, in, you know, in, at least in certain poorer neighborhoods, no matter what the background, people don't have as much access to physical distancing or, you know, social distancing, as you call it. And some of them, or many of them are considered essential workers. So they have to go into their jobs, whatever they are, whether they're hospitals, grocery stores, et cetera. And many of them would be taking public transportation. And so you're just around so many more people. There's so much of a higher chance on top of the possibility that they had a worse health um, status to begin with because of these um, um, lack of access or, or historically uh, lower rates of access to care. So it's certainly a huge concern. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that there are disparities in these places, but I, I also feel like there's some sort of increased number regardless of those sorts of issues. And I think we just, everybody wants to take extra care. And if you have people in those places, just reach out to them and, you know, tell them how, how serious and what, sometimes when it's not right in your town. And I think there, right. there has been some misinformation out there in general. I know some of my African-American friends and um, other folks have said, you know, well, we thought that we were immune to it or, or you know, it was a disease mm -hmm. of maybe Chinese people or, or mm -hmm. affluent people in New York that were Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Um, so when it doesn't hit necessarily right home, one doesn't see the effects. And some of these effects we're seeing weeks and weeks after the mm -hmm. virus might come into the community. So we right. just want to still put a message out there that we can still make a difference um, by keeping the social distancing as best we can. Uh, absolutely. And I, I would just echo that, that even um, in the states, like you said, certain states are not enforcing the stay at home or safer at home orders. And I think, yes, it's incumbent upon all of us to follow that, whether the state is not enforcing that or not, because that's what we're seeing is these outbreaks are happening because these orders were not in place in time, you could say. So you don't want to wait until it's right in your town or that it's hit loved ones. You need to take that action now. And like you said, Dr. Subramanian, to spread that message among your community. Um, and also on the reverse, in communities where they feel that they've hit that peak or are reaching the peak and that numbers are supposed to be coming down. For example, in New Orleans, one of my friends who's an intensivist there said, okay, it seems like the, the peak is coming down and New Orleans was a very hard hit city. The concern is that people will then start relaxing their own precautions that they've been taking because they think that, they're, that this is kind of coming down in, in their area and therefore it's not an issue. So I agree that all of us need to maintain the utmost diligence about this still. Yeah. And can, Nina, can you explain a little bit about, you know, when they say the surge is going to hit at this time frame, mm -hmm. um, what does that mean to you and to, what should people take away from that? Right. So that's really an interesting uh, question that we're kind of looking at every single day to see what is the surge, when is it coming? So for example, in some of the local hospitals in my area in Los Angeles, uh, where I've been you know, in touch with many doctors in these areas so that we kind of have a sense of what they're dealing with and how we can all help each other to prepare in that way, they had already thought that the surge, again, this is just in Los Angeles, that the surge was um, basically here last week. So many hospitals had started pulling doctors of other specialties. So for example, my brother is an ophthalmologist <laughs> at a large, large health system, and they assigned him to an emergency medicine shift overnight. So he was so nervous because one, a lot of doctors are very nervous about being exposed to COVID, but more than that, he was saying, I haven't worked in an emergency room for years. <laughs> I don't know what to do there. How am I going to help these people? So, you know, the, the hospitals, it's wonderful that they're planning for this so-called surge, which basically means um, a tremendous increase in numbers, which can happen, you know, even within a 24 hour period. So you really have to sort of be prepared for that in terms of um, staffing, testing, beds available, ventilators, you know, all these things that we hear about on the news. So that's why this surge preparation is so critical because you don't want to pull all your resources and have them on deck if there's no surge available. That takes away from primary care, other specialty care that people still need. Those problems don't go away even though we're having this pandemic, right? So, you know, you have to really be very careful about allocating the resources appropriately. You also don't want to expose all of your healthcare workers to COVID patients at one time because they might get sick and then they're out of the workforce. So 
again, when we talk about the surge, it's sort of an iffy thing. In my brother's situation, as I said, they had already assigned him to the shift, and now they said, okay, we're canceling that because the surge is not here, but it might be here on Saturday, so we'll let you know. So <laughs> honestly, um, like epidemiologists, et cetera, they're just looking at these numbers constantly, and it would be, um, you would consider that the surge would be different in different places at different times. So it's not necessarily going to be one, one surge you know, across the country or obviously across the world, as we've seen, you know, different places are surging at different times. It's almost like the ocean with the waves coming in, you know, and you don't know exactly when this big wave is coming. Um, and then you might have a period of them. So, so we'll see, but we are definitely bracing for that surge of cases. Um, uh, certainly here, the cases are increasing every day. It's not that they're not, but it's not again, considered to that surge level of just a tremendous flood of cases that has increased, you know, compared to the prior period, which could be a day or a few days or a week. But I think for pa people in their homes and patients in general and the public, I think even if there's surges coming and going, one right. should still listen to the local um, advice, uh, at least in California, you know, about where to stay, you know, sheltering in place and, and things like that. I think um, it's largely, I think, you know, people are getting a sense that that means as soon as the, the day of the surge is done that we can you know, go back to doing what we were doing. It's not exactly going to be like that. I think it's going to be an ebb and flow of patients. And really what the surge to me is about is the, the, the hospitals preparing their resources so that they can tackle more patients around that time frame. But for the individual person that's doing their part and taking care of themselves so that we can, you know, all take care of each other, it's really about, um, you know, following the guidelines still. And I don't think that it, you know, the, I, I think here in California, it's like April 17th is like some, some day of whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know how, um, how that's really translatable for the individual person to change their behavior. You know, it's just stay in place, stay at home, right. try not to do, um, you know, the thing. What have you been telling, let's say a geriatrics patient, let's say an 80 year old, you know, person with high blood pressure and diabetes in your neighborhood. Let's say I know you've been posting a lot on, um, you know, social media and stuff, just mm -hmm. trying to help your friends and family. I think around some of these things. So tell us a little few tips around safety in that population. Sure. So in terms of safety, I mean, again, the number one is to stay at home and not just stay at home, but I think a lot of people, and especially now because people are getting a little so-called cabin fever and that sort of thing of being there. They might be staying at home, but they might be inviting others to their home um, because they want some socialization, which is so understandable. But even that is completely not acceptable in terms of safety. Um, and so that's why even staying at home, but having others is just absolutely not a good idea still at this time. And when I say at this time, like you said, we don't know for how much longer, but I would imagine a while, you know, at least uh, probably a few months, unfortunately. So to kind of, we have to sort of accept that difficult fact. Um, so we definitely want to stay away from others that are not already living in our house that we're exposed to. So grocery shopping to me is a really big issue because most people are abiding by the staying at home, I think, I hope, but that's a, a necessity to go get groceries. And so people are going and I am absolutely avoiding the grocery stores because I think they are so scary. I think that's a, a huge mode of transmission in so many different ways. And so even though, even if they have, let's say senior hours um, or, or they have hours for people with health issues, I've been hearing about that. Um, they now like Costco in my area has uh, hours for healthcare workers or, or sorry, priority access for healthcare workers. Still, all of those things are still concerning to me because so, you know, there, there might be lines to enter the store and even though they're spacing people out, you're still going to come in contact with some people. In the store, again, you might have some contact with other shoppers, even if there are limited numbers of shoppers, you would have contact with the uh, cash register person, the bagger. Um, and then not only that, the products. So people have gone in, they've touched lots of the products or even the grocery store employees would have touched the products to put them on the shelves. So there's just so much contact going on um, besides just the direct, what they call droplet and aerosolization modes of transmission. There's also the contact on these surfaces. So to me, it's really a big concern. So I, I think a lot of people use grocery shopping as sort of an outing, you know, it's, it's a authorized, allowed, um, 
necessity, right? And so that's okay. So people are using it as a, a way of interacting with others, of getting out of their house, which sounds great. But again, for all the reasons I mentioned, I do think it's still so concerning. So what I've been um, asking people, if, if at all possible, and obviously this is not possible for everybody, but have other people shop for you. So for example, my parents, they are both fairly healthy in their 70s. Um, so they don't have many of the so-called comorbidities that we talked about. They do have high blood pressure, but that's about it. So, you know, you'd think that they're fairly safe, but they have not left their house for one month and they are, you know, petrified of even the thought of leaving at this time. I haven't been visiting them. We live very close to each other. And I used to stop by several times a week, have dinner, that sort of thing. We're not doing that. My brother, who I mentioned, he and his children are not going over. We're just taking all of these precautions. If, I, if they need groceries, then I'm buying them, um, trying to buy everything at one time. And I'm doing this for three households, my own, my parents, my boyfriend, just so we can each limit our exposure and we'll just shop for each other. And then I would drop off the groceries on my parents' porch and back off, maybe say hi from a tremendous distance while they're still inside their house and I'm outside. Um, so that's a really big way we can help help each other is if you have family or friends, I know so many people don't want to be a burden on each other, but I think this is such a different time. This is a time when we have to do that. And it's also a time when so many people are willing to help and want to help. And so I think that, you know, there's no shame in asking somebody to help get you some groceries or so many people are doing online shopping. So if uh, I know my, my mom was trying to do that and it took about 10 days to get the order through, I mean, that's a big problem right now too. So even if you're not able to do it yourself, again, ask somebody else if they're doing an online shopping order, can they help you with that? Um, but, you know, so that's in terms, of, I, I think those are the main things I would recommend in terms of safety, at least in terms of what the majority of people are encountering, I think, right now. Um, and if you do have to go out, of course, wear a mask. Finally, that's now the CDC recommendation after so much back and forth, whether we should wear a mask or not. So. Um, definitely wear a mask in Los Angeles. They are uh, mandating that now. So that's another important way. And, and then the, you know, the main advice that you keep hearing is wash your hands. I mean, we can't overemphasize how important that is and to do it for the 20 seconds that they say and to really get every surface of your hands in between the fingers, the thumbs, you know, all of this that sometimes we kind of miss. So when I touch anything, I immediately to go and wash my hands and of course to keep things sanitized in your home and when you do get groceries whether you've purchased them or somebody else has dropped them off to immediately clean things off because the virus can live on cardboard for 24 hours on paper for a period of time they're not exactly sure it can last on plastic so that could be plastic uh, food bags um, packages that can be two to three days so, you know, and then metal surfaces are even longer, maybe seven to eight days at times. So even anything that comes into your house to be just very vigilant about cleaning all that or leaving it aside for several days if you don't, if it's something that's non-perishable and that you don't need to touch, you know, that's another thing you could do. So we have a few comments here. I um, mean, we'll just take a couple of them before we get too much farther. One was a question about skin cancer and does skin cancer put you at higher risk for um, this virus? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I haven't heard anything about skin cancer, but what I would say with any cancer is that if somebody is currently undergoing treatment for their cancer, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation therapy, that that does lower your immunity. And so that's where you could be at a higher risk. Anytime your immune system is suppressed does put you at a higher risk. But usually for skin cancers, if it's been um, something that's surgically removed or that you have that you haven't had dealt with yet, I don't believe that that would in itself put you at a higher risk. Yeah, that sounds about right to me too. Um, so there's just a few comments about um, asking. So somebody's saying, yeah, wipe down the groceries. Somebody asked about um, how to clean fresh produce. Do you have a tip on that one? So what um, my mom Mom is a biologist, so she's always been really big on <laughs> cleanliness, hygiene, germs, all of that. So what she's been doing is washing everything with soap and water, all the produce. Um, so she, she got this delivery of uh, farmer's market produce. So you would think that that should be pretty clean, but again, you can't be too cautious. So she washed everything with soap and water, then she put it in the sun 
um, one to dry, but also, you know, there are a lot of theories that the sun can't <laughs> help to kill this virus or that heat, et cetera. I can't verify any of that, but I don't think it could hurt for sure. <laughs> so, so I, I, I mean, I think uh, washing things, er, wash everything you possibly can is what I'd say. That sounds good. Um, agree totally. So, um, yeah, so I think there's some comments just about, you know, people who can't leave their home and getting help from right. others. I think, you know, there's a lot of, we've had on these um, chats in the last, I don't know how many weeks, um, people even saying that they feel better when they are able to help others and people right. have been asking them how to help. So this is something I think if you have a neighbor that's asking you if they can help you, accept the help, it may actually help them, you know, with feeling better about the whole thing. And, and it sort of makes the world go round a little bit. I think, you know, everyone is feeling a little bit helpless and they want to see even if there's a small thing that they can do. So if it's something that, you know, you sure pick me up some bananas, I don't know, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, it's a nice way for, you know, the, the everyone to help and feel a little good and to keep you guys as patients um, safe at home. So um, I think those are the main comments here. Um, and then what about masks? So I think, you know, in LA at least there's been, it, there's a sense that as long as you're covering your this portion with some sort of fabric, so they've said right. bandanas, um, scarves, uh, things like that. Um, so I think that's one um, that, 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 you know, just, and, and, and those sorts of cloth masks that people are wearing, What's your sense of why people are wearing, like what, what, is, what can that help with? Right, so even with, for example, sur sorry, surgical masks, which are the kind of uh, yellow, I'm sure I have some around here, but the masks that people usually wear in hospitals if they need to. So even those kind of masks, the thought is that if you wear that, you are protecting other people from yourself. So meaning uh, protecting others from your droplets and possibly the aerosol. So if you cough, sneeze, even speak. Um, but you're not necessarily protecting yourself from picking up something from others. So I think the same would be true with the cloth masks. Um, so they definitely do provide some sort of barrier, but I wouldn't go out thinking that now you are completely safe from this virus and that it cannot get to you. Again, it's a great precaution to help um, reduce the spread but more think of it that you're helping others rather than that much helping yourself. Certainly it can help um, to eliminate um, direct droplet inhalation by yourself. So, so it definitely would help with that. Um, but uh, in, again, in terms of aerosol, et cetera, these very fine particles, you could still ingest that even with a mask. So it's still extremely important to wear the mask because again, overall we want to so-called flatten the curve. And so you'd still be contributing to that by wearing it. Um, but but again, don't use that, don't take that as a false sense of security. And I just saw somebody um, pop up saying that uh, don't touch your face if you wear a mask. And that's such an important point. I've heard one study that um, they found that people when they're wearing a mask, they touch their face even more, um, which kind of makes sense because, you know, I'm wearing a mask most of the day. I just took it off for, for this chat right now, but it's itchy, it's hot, you know, you want to adjust it, all these things you do. There is a tendency to touch your face a lot with that. Um, and especially anybody who might have some kind of respiratory problems already, it could certainly be very difficult. So regardless of the mask or not, yes, do not touch your face. That's just another way of introducing uh, the virus there. But um, the cloth masks are, are certainly a really great thing. We even had a volunteer make some and drop them off at our clinic. Um, that, again, they're, she's trying to do this as service to others. And so, like you said, so many people want to help in various ways. So again, ask some of your friends if, if they have any masks or if they're making them and that they could spare one for you. It'd be a good thing. Um, yeah, but if you don't have one, I think even, you know, taking a piece of cloth, there's a lot yeah. of DIY things on the right. internet, um, bandanas even, but it's really about just covering this area and, and it's not to prevent you from getting it. It's really right. that if you are having drops, so like bigger drops that they won't come up, but really what we're worried about with the spread of this is that there's very, very small particles, almost in like a mist or um, that if somebody's coughing or if you're in a healthcare provider, for example, and you're working right around patients, that the air has very fine, fine droplets. And that's really why in healthcare settings that we're using stronger masks that are really about, um, you know, trying to prevent you from getting it. And that's right. in the healthcare provider healthcare provider setting. And I don't really see a need um, to wear, if you're alone in your home, I've seen people 
driving around with masks and wearing them in their homes. Right. I mean, I think really, it's not about, you know, if, if you're in your own space, you don't have to wear a mask, uh, is my sense, right? Right, exactly. But again, just make sure that, you know, let's say you have gone to the store and you come back um, and then you take off your mask, that involves usually touching your face, you know, so you just have to be very cautious, maybe sanitize your hands before doing that wipe down with wipes your steering wheel, your seat in your car, because again, these are all surfaces that you're contacting that could pick up the virus. Um, and somebody asked what's a good way to take off the mask. So you really don't want to be, a lot of people I see are sitting there doing this all day with these masks and like, you know, pulling it on and like eating with the mask around them. Oh and, gosh, right. You know, like, and then I mean, sometimes even have gloves on while doing this. And so, you know, in healthcare settings, we really, you know, when we wear gloves, we're doing it for a specific activity. So we say, you know, you're sick, I'm going to be near you and touching you. Let me put the gloves on. We have a very set way of washing our hands before putting the gloves on, doing whatever we're doing, taking the gloves off in a very clear way so that we're not, you know, spreading the virus around. So I think, you know, when we're using these things, it's really about thinking about the contact of whatever you're touching to these places and being careful not to exacerbate it by wearing gloves all day and then touching a mask right. and you know this exactly kind of, yeah. um if the mask has the elastic loops that go behind the ears then it's the you know of course clean your hands first but then pull it from there to remove it rather than from uh, actually touching your face okay so keeping your hands generally away from and if you have gloves on right. don't touch your face right. take the gloves off and hand washing is still probably the most uh important thing people have asked about going for a run with a mask on um I think we keep getting different data. I mean, with running and the spread of this, it's been very tough to give people advice. I, I think if you're outside right now, LA is asking you to cover your, your mouth. Right. Anyways, right. And it also depends on the population density where you live. If you live in a place where you're pretty sure you're not going to be encountering too many people, if you go for a walk or run, I think that should be fine. But if you're in a busy city and you're constantly passing people, that would be, you know, a bad idea. So it just really depends on the your local area and what you can do safely. Great. Yeah. I want to switch gears, Mina. Um, you and I have talked about this before, and it's been something that I've been passionate about, and you've been very passionate about, I think, as well. We don't have a ton of time. We could, I think you and I could talk for hours, basically. <laughs> we might have to come back. Um, but in the last 15 minutes or so, I wanted to switch gears a little bit to advanced uh, care planning. Okay. Um, you know, and maybe you could just define that as you think about it and speak a little bit about it in the COVID era and, and what maybe is effect. You may not know necessarily about Parkinson's patients, but right. around the patients that you have. Right. Um, it's such an important topic. So I'm so glad you brought this up. Is it possible for us to do a show of hands? Who has an advanced care directive already? Just out of curiosity. Okay, I have to look at the next screen. Keep your hands up if you can. <laughs> There's a lot of people on here. Um, well, from those who have their video, it looks like most of you do, almost everybody, so that's great. Uh, I'd say congratulations for that. That's a really big deal. It's, it's a difficult thing to do, I think, to really kind of um, address all of these questions, to kind of face your own mortality in that way, but it is so incredibly important, so I really applaud all of you for having that. And also, I think it's worth uh, reviewing every few years. Like uh, in my clinic, we say, you know, every three years, we should review that at least. If your condition changes, of course, we should do that sooner. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is, um, in general, advanced care planning is something I do with all of my patients. And what it means to me, like you asked, is really to look at what our goals are for our life in terms of our healthcare, and certainly in terms of our death, because there is actually a lot we can control about that process. Um, it might not be exactly when it happens, but certainly how and where it happens. There's so much um, input and control that we have that I think it's important to assert, because I just have seen too many patients die in ways that I know they wouldn't have wanted, because either it wasn't documented or because their family member, you know, had power of attorney and then the, the children are fighting about it at the end and saying, no, we have to do this to mom. No, we have to keep her on the ventilator forever. You know, so all these things. So that's why having it written out in clear detail is so tremendously important. So, you know, the two parts of that are one, the POLST form, which I believe is standard in all states, but it's a state-by-state -state form, the physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. 
which is basically the DNR form, whether you would want um, CPR, you know, to be attempted if your heart were to stop, if you were non-responsive. So that's part of it. Um, and that's just a one page form, which is a legal document that you can sign along with your doctor and keep in your home in a prominent place in case anything happens. But the other part, the actual advanced care directive is usually a much more extensive form. And some, of those, some people have those prepared by their lawyers. In my clinic, we have them in every single room um, so that it's this little maybe six page booklet that we go over with our patients, let them take it home, discuss it with their loved ones and fill out and bring back. So it goes into questions like, if I were no longer able to, um, to breathe on my own, would I want to be on a breathing machine? Would I want this temporarily? Would I want it for an extensive period of time? If I were no longer to meaningfully interact with my loved ones, would I want my life to be extended or would I not? You know, so it really just looks at what are kind of our individual um, core values. And so I think that's a really um, critical thing for all of us to look at. And again, most of you have, so you know already kind of what I'm talking about. But um, in terms of COVID, I think it's yet another time to really look at these questions. And I've been trying to do that with uh, my patients um, because now it's really a whole new kind of frontier, you could say, where people who are um, getting ill with the disease that are in this high risk category that we already talked about, many of them are declining very quickly. Um, so it's kind of a new kind of concept of, well, would they still want to be put on a ventilator even though they had before stated that that's what they wanted? But now given how things are going with COVID, would they really want that? People are kind of, when they're on the ventilators, like we saw in Italy, people are lasting on them for a year, or for, sorry, for up to two weeks at a time, which is a very poor, it, it predicts a very poor outcome if you're on a ventilator that long. So would you really want to go through that? Another huge question, which I think is really important to look at in light of COVID is to note the fact that now most hospitals are not allowing visitors. So that's a huge problem. So people are dying alone in the hospital, which is just so heartbreaking. Um, maybe at the very end of life, one visitor might be allowed, but sometimes it's too late. And it's again, just one person and that's hospital by hospital. But for the most part, you can assume that visitors are not allowed. So I think that's a really important consideration whether just worst case, if this were to happen, would that be okay with you? Additionally, that's happening in a lot of nursing homes, um, like the ones I work in. I work in two other facilities in my community besides the one I told you about. And same thing, visitors have not been allowed for weeks. So these are even healthy facilities where nobody has COVID, but they're preventing visitors because of uh, their goal of preventing the spread. So, you know, it's such a different time. And I think that makes it so important to reevaluate what our goals are given this new era. Sure, that's, that's really um, important. I think revisiting it, and even if you had it, I mean, I think some patients are like, yeah, yeah, I have it. And then when they actually look at the form, like, oh, did I actually write that? I don't, I mean, <laughs> when did I fill this out? You know, sometimes you might've had the conversation, but it isn't documented. And what ends up happening, at least historically, is that if people haven't expressed what they want, what people don't understand is that the baseline historically has been just to, to offer everything. And so right. unless- right say I don't want CPR, I don't want this and that. It's like the baseline if somebody called 911, even if you know your your wife knew exactly, you know, that you didn't want these things. And let's say she's out and there's a caregiver there and then your heart stops and then you know the the neighbor comes by and like call 911. So then the you know the paramedics come, their baseline unless they see a form on the fridge, which is where usually these forms should be placed. Um, is to do everything. And then people are in a situation where you're trying to then take away things. Um, and, 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 you know, these resuscitation situations are quite traumatic. Um, it's hard to describe them unless you've actually either resuscitated someone or been, you know, in them. Um, but it's, it's just, uh, and in the COVID era, actually, one of the concerns so that people understand a little bit is that number one, in some of these places, there are limited resources. I think, um, you know, places like New, New, New York City and things, and hopefully that won't come to pass in all of everywhere in the United States, including on our coast here. 
but it is something to weigh into the equation. And then the second thing is that healthcare providers are actually at increased risk of getting sick with some of these procedures. So if you are COVID positive um, and somebody is doing CPR on you, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that th there's a lot of spread of the virus and everybody around might get sick from it as well. And often right. the outcomes of those sorts of things are also not great. And so we're sort of, um, again, it's, it's a time I think that's very different than historically where we as a community of doctors and healthcare providers and you know, people of the world all need to come together and say, you know, these are the facts and what's the best sort of way to think about this. Um, and I have been starting to approach my patients a little bit um, and ask them, you know, if, have you thought about if you got sick, what you would want? And I think, you know, this is a bit of a different paradigm than before. So I think it's definitely mm -hmm. important to maybe revisit. And uh, the folks here at the PMD Alliance are going to be spending some more time uh, in the next couple months actually having, we have a hospice doc coming on and we might actually have a few more palliative care providers um, talking about some of these things because I think these are issues that are, we're, we're having to deal with, even if it's not from our own Parkinson's, you know, lens, it's from just, you know, hearing about other people passing um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, preventing things from happening in a way which, which end up with a really, you know, tragic kind of end. So I see a few more comments. One is about brain donation. Um, there's a website here. Um, Mina, if you could uh, give us maybe, I don't know, what's the resource that you use? You said the poll swarm, and we can provide maybe that information, Andrea, um, at the end of this. That's the P-O-L-S-T, and that's different in each state. It usually requires, you know, somebody like a doctor um, or somebody to sign off on it. Um, and then what's the second document that you mentioned? Is it a specific, um, um, is it one so that you guys made or something different? Right, so um, I work for UCLA, um, as do you, and so UCLA has made its own document, uh, its own advanced care directive packet. And so your health system, wherever any of you go, they might have their own um, packet that you could ask for, or um, your, Again, some of you might have made one through lawyers, for example, but now a lot of health systems are really developing excellent directives, which really go through so many questions and are very clear. Many advanced care directives that I've seen from that were made years ago or by lawyers, they're kind of still vague or kind of difficult to understand. Even if I'm reading it, I'm not sure what they'd want. So it's called an advanced care directive. Um, and again, there's not just one set one, but one initiative that came up a few years ago, which is also a form of, of an advanced care directive is called the five wishes. Um, I don't know if any yep. of you have heard about that. Sarah, yeah, but Sarah, who, um, uh, Sarah Jones, who is, uh, you know, the leader over here, uh, okay. a boss lady, she's, she does some of this uh, with patients as well. So, okay. so the, five the five wishes is something that they five have wishes. spent some time. And I wasn't sure if there was something that was a bit different in the um, setting of uh, COVID that might be, you know, I think the five wishes oh. may not be exactly um, the right, I think we're all looking for the right tools to give advice around, but it doesn't hurt to look around, I think, and list some, and people can kind of get a sense of what might speak to them, and it may assist you in having conversations, usually probably with right. your primary care doctor or a social worker that works with the primary care doctor, or are usually exactly. the two main folks, right? Exactly. Or are there right. other folks? Yeah. And no, so those, are two, yeah. those are the two main. And, you know, one more thing I wanted to mention in term, that's related to this, but also in terms of your question about safety is about going to your doctor's offices for visits right now. I know that's just such another confusing and gray area. Um, so what we're doing, and I'm sure you're doing a lot of this too, and there is a lot of telemedicine, yep. so phone calls with our patients. And I think that's just tremendously important to keep up with your doctor. What's happening in my office, so many patients, because they're scared of COVID, they're just canceling their appointments. And I want to still be able to keep up and keep connected with them because of all their other chronic conditions, even loneliness. I want to just check in with them, make sure that they're doing okay and all these different aspects. So for you, please at least call your doctor's office if you have an appointment scheduled and ask if you can do it on the phone if it's not something that has to be seen in person. We even have video capabilities. So I had a, a, a patient with this uh, skin lesion and she was able to show it to me on video and I was able to treat it that way. So I just wanted to say in terms of our chronic conditions, you know, please don't lose uh, touch with your doctors about that. And definitely, again, with this advanced care planning, you can do that by phone with your doctor or if you have a social worker. 
Yeah, perfect. Um, and also, you don't want to run out of your medications and stuff. I think most people right. want to make sure that you have refills. So definitely don't fall off of those lists and just cancel because right. many of our I know at the VA, we've been really stressed out about trying to figure out who canceled off of these lists because we don't exactly. have any ways to try. Once you call and cancel, especially on those automated systems, there's really, it's not very clear where you went in the right. system, you know, and, and because we don't have a lot of ways to just automatically reschedule because a lot of our coordinators are, you know, doing many duties and, and pulled in different directions, it becomes harder to, um, to yeah, uh, kind of keep you in, in, in sort of from falling through the cracks. So probably yeah. even if it's a fight and if you're worried, like you're going to waste your doctor's time, I've just been happy to, you know, hear my patient's voice. We miss you just as much as you guys mm -hmm. miss us. And right. so, you know, if it's a quick check-in um, to say hello, and do you have enough pills and, you know, just again, cementing some of these COVID safety issues and maybe just met, you know, starting the conversation around, you know, if I got sick, I'd want these things. I think it's helpful, you know, and some of these things may not be done, you know, like over the phone this minute, it's more of a conversation that might be um, carried out over some period of time. Mm -hmm. There's been a few comments. Uh, somebody said they'd like to see a webinar on updating advanced directives, especially in context of COVID treatment strategies. And then somebody wrote up the five wishes, um, the Pulsed web websites, all that, and the brain donation stuff. Um, so I think we have covered a lot of these topics, including the worry about doing CPR and things like that. That's why is the worry about spreading some of these infections. So I just wanted to thank you so much, Mina. I'll hand it off to you just for a last maybe one minute um, wrap up, and then we'll hand it back to um, Andrea. Sure. Thanks. So um, I think, you know, it's been and really a pleasure to be with all of you and some excellent questions and comments that have come up and I'm sorry if we didn't specifically address each one, um, but I think everybody seems to be on the same page here. And, you know, besides just the incredible emphasis on safety, I can't overemphasize the need for everybody to stay connected. And I'm sure that's been discussed um, in your prior meetings, but, you know, as a, as a person, as a daughter of older people and as a geriatrician, I mean, this is honestly one of my biggest concerns right now is that people do not get isolated. Um, older adults are definitely at huge risk of isolation. And so many of my patients, even prior to this, many of my patients who have Parkinson's, they already have a tendency to isolation because many times, you know, they're limited in their ability to, to go out, their mobility. Um, eating is difficult in, in public, and so in many ways they tend to be isolated a little bit from what I've seen. Um, and so given this new situation, I just want to say please take, you know, every action that you can to connect with your loved ones by phone, by video like this. All of you are obviously pretty tech savvy to be on here. <laughs> it's impressive. It's, uh, I'm still learning about Zoom myself. So you they know, actually just, spend time before this, the 30 minutes before oh. the that's right. Everyone, it's it's that's, a labor of love. I can't even tell you how not you are that is. All offering you and your okay. All right. Well, very many positive messages on the on the chat here. Um, thanks, everyone. So, Andrea, off to you. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, we're going to be meeting again Monday at noon. Um, we have a movement disordered nurse practitioner. Um, who practiced at NYU, and now she's at Swedish Neurosciences in the Pacific Northwest. She's gonna, we're gonna be talking about tolerating uncertainty. You know, this is unprecedented. Parkinson's in itself is unprecedented in any of our lives, and we don't know what it's gonna look like, and then you add coronavirus into it. She's gonna give us some, um, we're gonna explore how do you even, you know, ride that wave and, and deal with uncertainty as well as some actual, you know, um, pragmatic things that we can do, not just around coronavirus, but life is uncertain. So things that we can do in general. So Monday, noon Pacific, same bat time, same bat channel. We hope <laughs> to see you all back. And until then, have a great week. I have one last thing to say. Yeah, please. I was going to say, this video specifically is probably the least Parkinson-specific video that we've done. And I think the most helpful possibly to everyone in the universe who might be at home. Um, so definitely share this link if you can, because I think Mina's tips were just universally great for anyone who's aging and all of our parents and, and loved ones as well. So. And we're all aging, so really universally. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to point that out, but yes. 
<laughs> That's true. Okay. Thanks guys. Thank Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.